Well, last week, Pastor Ken uh, spoke about being ready. We're going verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke, and we happen to be in Luke chapter 12. And as uh, we considered this idea of being ready, um, that really means that there's a time that's coming. And whenever there's a time that's coming, we should be ready for that time. All of us have been in situations where you're making arrangements, maybe for a dinner with somebody, and you say, hey, let's meet next week, six o'clock dinner on Friday. And so there's a time coming, but you're not really thinking about it. The further out the event is, the less you think about getting ready for it. Would you agree with that? Marriage in a year. Our son is just engaged, maybe getting married next fall. They're thinking about things now, but it's not this pressure yet up until the week or two weeks before the nerves start to get you. But as you're far away from it, you are not as worried about it. But as the time gets closer, you're more thinking about it. So you have dinner plans. Let's meet next Friday for dinner at 6 p.m. Great. You put on your calendar, you block it off. The day before, your friend says, I'll come pick you up. Great, now you know something about what's going to happen. At 4 o'clock on the day of the event, they text you and say, I'll be there at 5.30. Then at 5 o'clock, they say, leaving my house right now. You've had this happen. (laughs) Then at 5.30, here, and they're right outside. And now you are ready to go because it is time. As time progresses and gets closer to the actual event, we need to be more and more ready. When I was in high school, I used to get picked up every morning by my friend who had a license before me, and he had a car, and so he would pick me up. And I was having uh, this dream in my sleep, and as I was dreaming, I was actually driving a car, and I was at a traffic light, and I was distracted. It wasn't distracted by a cell phone because we just didn't have those in those days, you know? But I was distracted by something, and I was looking down, and I hear this honking. I look up, and the light arrow had turned green, so I start driving in my dream to turn left, but the honking continues, and I wake up. It's my friend outside honking for me to come, and he woke me up, and I got ready really fast, and we got to work late. And so when the time approaches, the urgency of dealing with something becomes a bit more pressing. This week, Jesus is going to be talking about the present time that he's in, in the context of what these people, the disciples and the crowds and all that we've been studying are learning and hearing about. And so for, t- for us today, uh, we want to consider the times. We want to discern the times. We want to be people who decide to follow Jesus. And that's what we're going to be seeing here in the text. He gives us a call to consider the times. I've titled the message today, The Time Is Now. The Time Is Now. We're in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. The time is now, Luke chapter 12, verse 49, starting here, it says this. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. The time is now, first thought from Jesus, a time of division for what you believe. A time of division for what you believe. I came, Jesus says, I came. These statements, I came, they're talking about his mission. Whenever you see Jesus said, I have come or I came, he's talking about why he is here, why he is here on earth. He's highlighting his mission here. And normally, as we think about Jesus, we typically, and people in the world, typically have a good view of Jesus. They respect Jesus. They think he was a good teacher. He probably had a lot of good things to say. I mean, children were drawn to him. People who were outcasts were drawn to him. He's like a pretty good guy. And when you think about Jesus, you think about somebody who is a bringer of peace. And yet Jesus says something very different. He says, I came to cast fire. That doesn't sound very good. If somebody had said to you, I'm going to come to your house and I want to cast fire in your living room, you would say, you know what? Let's wait on that. Let's get to know each other a little bit more. But Jesus, he says, I have come to do this, to cast fire. Fire is a divisive thing. Just think when fire comes onto a place, you want to separate from it. It burns and it purifies 
It does something. See, earlier in Luke, John the Baptist, when he was out in the wilderness, he was talking about Jesus and what he was going to do. We studied this last fall. It's so hard to believe. A year ago, Luke chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says this, I baptize you with water, John the Baptist speaking, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Jesus wants the fire, he says, I wish it would already be kindled. When you kindle something, you're getting smaller pieces of wood and maybe paper so that the bigger logs can start to catch on fire. He's saying, I wish that the fire was already started. I'm eager to get on with this. It's very difficult here. I'm in distress every day of my life thinking about what's coming, and I'm ready to do this right now. Jesus is coming with judgment. He is the lamb of God, but he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is coming, and he's got a fire that cannot be stopped. It is burning forever, and God is love, but he's also just, and he's trying to get his hearers, and maybe some of you here, to hear this truth that time is ticking, and you won't always have an opportunity to make a decision for him. He says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. So he says, I have a baptism that I need to have accomplished. Now, he was already baptized by John, as Sadie instructed us here. He had done it. That's right. He was already baptized in water in the Jordan, but this is a different baptism. He's talking about his death, his death on the cross, his payment for our sins. It was going to happen in this baptism. He is greatly distressed about it. He is thinking about it. Every day is a reminder that he is getting closer and closer to the cross. Every day with its sunrise and sunset would be a day closer to the cross. Every day that he would spend praying to the Father, thinking about what was to come, him being the propitiation, the satisfaction of the wrath of God, the payment, the atonement, all of these things were causing him great distress. And here he is in a moment of vulnerability with a large crowd saying, and I am in distress Here, there is a cleansing coming through Jesus' death. His death is his baptism. Can you sense the distress in Jesus' voice here? He's going to suffer, and it's costly. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, I've referenced it several times over the last several months. Luke 9, 51, and Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. That's the series we're in right now, the journey No turning back. Can't you see it? There's no turning back. I've started this journey. He's left Nazareth. He's left Galilee. He's gone through Samaria. He's making his way step by step to Jerusalem. And as he gets closer to Jerusalem, it's the cross. He is greatly distressed because there's a baptism. His death is coming in Jerusalem. So he is greatly distressed. The pain of the moment is with him. Can you feel it in his heart? If you knew you were going to die, You would have moments of being greatly distressed about it, thinking about those that you're leaving behind, thinking about what it's going to be like when you take your last breath, thinking about what it's going to be like on the other shore when you get to heaven. Some people outside of the faith, they are greatly distressed because they don't know what's going to happen. They have no hope. They think that they have some ideas, but they don't know. And so there is distress and Jesus knows the outcome, but still the thought of being separated from his father for those hours on the cross, taking the wrath of God upon himself caused him great distress. He says this in verse 51, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. He asked this question about peace. And most of us, when we think about Jesus, we think about peace. I mean, he is called the Prince of Peace, right? We're already starting to plan our Christmas services. And at Christmas time, we're going to sing peace on earth, goodwill towards men, towards humankind. And so this is what's coming. We know this about Jesus. He is peace. Christ is our peace. Here's a few verses. John 14, verse 27. He says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He is going to give peace. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of his hostility. Peace is what Jesus is about. Now, peace in general terms is the absence of conflict, but it's also a peace that we have with God. It's a peace that we have of being settled, an assurance that everything's going to be okay. When you have peace, you are calm, and Jesus does bring this. So is this a contradiction here? Some people say, well, see, it's a contradiction. You say he's our peace, but he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring division. But notice who he's talking to. He's talking to the crowds. And some in the crowds are going to be divided by the word that Jesus brings. And some in the crowd are going to have peace. And so you can have peace if you've confessed Jesus. And so it's not a contradiction, but he has a very strong, divisive message that he brings. Recognize your sin. Confess it. Believe I died for you. Repent. Be baptized. All these things. He says, do this. It is a divisive message. And if you don't, then there is no salvation for you. There is no eternity for you. And so, frankly, some people just don't want to change. They don't want to hear this. They want to keep going the way that they are. They're set in their ways. They have some pride. They just want to keep on living. But fire does that. He's come to cast fire and fire divides. What a strong word it here is here, this idea of division. To be divided means to be separated. It's divisiveness. It's dissension. It's hostility. There's a division that happens among people. Sometimes I'll say this to people I disagree with. I'll say, we'll just agree to disagree. And you can disagree to disagree about a lot of things. You can agree to disagree about a lot of things. But this thing right here, you don't want to disagree on. And what happens is we disagree so much, families will disagree here, that it leads towards opposite sides. And so there's hostility. There's division. Jesus didn't come to bring peace, but division, he says. Yes, it's a me message of love, but it's also one of truth. Love means I'm going to be truthful with you. Just ask any parent. They don't just sugarcoat it with their children when they've done wrong because they are the most loving people in those children's lives. And yet they tell them the truth because love demands truth. And Jesus wants to tell truth. Verse 52, it says, For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He lays out the fact that in homes, he's just laying it all out there. He's giving every scenario, a house of five, two will be against three. And in this other house, three will be against two. And a father will be against his son and a son will be against his father and a mother will be against his daughter and her daughter will be against the mother. And then the mother-in-law will be against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And some of you daughter-in-laws were like, I knew it was biblical. <laughs> but Jesus is saying the animosity that we feel goes both ways. The animosity that we have when one person believes and one doesn't believe, it is real. And it brings division in homes because here is a family, one person saying, this is the truth. And the other person saying, you're crazy. And you want me to do what? And you've changed. I've heard that testimony so many times. A wife comes to faith in Jesus and then the husband says, I just want my old wife back. I just want to be able to do the things we used to do. But the wife is so convicted about the way she used to live and how she wants to live now that there is division that comes. Can't you see it? Jesus brings division with his strong message and it divides households. And just imagine what it was like when the faith was just starting when it was just coming on the scene and how people would have been so divided over this. And so this is a serious message Jesus is giving. He has come to divide. It's a hard teaching. Now, we all have things that divide our home. I've talked about Susan and me and a very difficult disagreement we had about the White Sox. And I'm not a baseball fan at all. And so when the Cubs were doing well, I told you, I'm not even, you can go back and listen to that message. Anyway, we had the worst argument in front of our kids about the White Sox. And so you can be divided about some things, right? Um, this weekend is Bears-Packers game at noon. Thank you for being here early so you can go and catch it. Uh, Bears-Packers. And so sometimes there's division in homes, like this couple sitting right up here in the front. And we got a picture of them coming on the screen. Bears and Packers right there. Heather 
and Philip, and they are disagreeing. And I said, come to the nine o'clock service so you cannot worry about it while the game's going on. There's division over some things like this. Aaron Rodgers just said, I'm sorry, Heather, this is awful, Heather. Aaron Rodgers just said, I will play for any team in the NFL except the Bears. We don't want him anyway. He's so divisive. He's so divisive. All right, don't be, we love you. We're just, just not on game day. There's division about some things, right? They just don't matter. Just think about food. In Philadelphia, there are two cheesesteak places right across from each other. Gino's and Pat's. And they're right across the street from each other. And people are like, what's your favorite? It's like, oh, I'm Gino's. I like Pat's, you know. When we lived in Philadelphia for four years, Susan would not eat a Philly cheesesteak. She's like, it's betraying Chicago for some reason. I don't know. So she wouldn't eat it until we left Philadelphia, you know. But like sometimes you can be divided over something like food. What, do you know what this thing is coming up here? What's this called right here? What's this thing called? What'd you say? A lazy Susan. Oh my gosh. If you called it a lazy Susan in my house, you would be in trouble. Some of you have been to my house. You know what it is. Susan is like, there are no lazy Susans in this house. So Susan calls it an efficient Susan. And so it's great. You know, somebody comes over and they're like, oh, I love, we have a square table. They're like, I just love this. And you got this lazy Susan there. And usually she's in the kitchen. We're like, shh, the kids, everybody. They're like, wait, quiet, don't do it. They're like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like, it's called an efficient Susan. And then now they've been warned. When they come back and they say, hi, I love your lazy Susan, even if they joke about it, I mean, it is on, right? <laughs> and we're joking. We've always fed them and we have a nice laugh about it. She's just joking about these things. But we can joke about a lot of stuff that are silly things that cause us division, right? But what about division of something of eternal value? What about when you are so burdened for another person who doesn't believe what you believe? It can cause strife in the home. It can make you so tense when you bring it up and you hope that they'll want to pray with you or maybe they'll accept my invitation to come and to church or they'll be tender-hearted about this thing that I want to do, or I want to give some money to the church, but they don't want to, and you can just feel the tension when it is something of eternal value. And Jesus is making a point here that he has a message that divides. It divides. It is a hard message, and we will be on one end of it. And he's driving us towards something. Attention existed in Jesus' day and it exists in our day. The message of Jesus is one of division. The time is now. Jesus is urgent. It's coming closer and closer. He was there in the beginning when he created the world. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then the time was coming and he showed up and he's here. The word of God incarnated and Jesus is saying the time is right now. There's an urgency to what Jesus is saying, a time of division for what you believe. Notice this next here, a time of discernment from what you have seen. A time of discernment from what you have seen. Verse 54, he also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once a shower is coming. And so it happens. He's been talking to his disciples for a while. Now he he uh, sometimes talks to the disciples, sometimes to the crowds, but he's still talking to the crowds over here. He's talking to the crowds and telling them, you see these things. And he's using examples from everyday life to show them that they have discernment about things that go on in the world, and yet they don't have discernment about these spiritual matters that they're seeing right before them. When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. I should have put a map up on the screen, but you can think about it like this. I'm trying to be like you. Okay, here's Israel over here, and here's the Mediterranean Sea. It's to the west of Israel. Just think about it. When you see a cloud rising in the west over the waters, that's where the rain is coming from. When you see the cloud rising in the west, you know that rain is coming. We know when rain is coming, you look out. Now we have radars and we have uh, all these apps on our phones to find out if it's going to rain. I was out on a ride a motorcycle ride a couple of weeks ago on a Monday with uh, one of our church family up in Mundelein. And we were looking at the radar and he said, I think it's going to be clear. And so we made a decision to go for a lunchtime ride. And as we were riding, I was leading out there and I saw a cloud heading up to Wisconsin in the distance, a dark cloud. 
So I knew it was rain over there, so I took a right. But that cloud was coming east towards us, and it caught us, and we just happened to get under some cover for about 20 minutes, and then we talked while the rain passed, and then we got back on our bikes and left. You know when it's going to rain when you look outside and see the clouds. Maybe some of you had grandparents like my grandmother. How do you know it's going to rain? I feel it in my bones. They didn't have the radar. They just knew by what was going on that it was about to rain. Jesus is saying, you discern these things, and yet you can't discern this present time. He goes on to talk about the wind. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say there will be a scorching heat, and it happens. Again, Israel over here, and then over here, Egypt and the desert. So Israel, and here's Egypt and the desert, and out of the desert, you can feel, you can see the wind blowing. That's where the hot air is coming. And so when you see the south wind blowing, you know that there is a scorching heat coming, and so you do something about it. You can discern these things from what you see. Verse 56, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? With all these great powers of observation, with this great discernment of the weather and of the wind, how come you can't tell what I'm doing? You're seeing it happen. It's being laid out in your midst right now, and yet you still keep on denying it. They can see what Jesus is doing, the miracles. They hear about it. They're watching, and yet they still doubt. They still wonder, what have you seen God do? What have you seen the Lord do? I had lunch a week ago with um, a man here in our church, and he was uh, in jail for murder. And you would have no idea about it, talking to him and seeing him now. Many years have passed. He's so different. He's changed. He's a new man. I would trust him with anything. How did that happen? You can interpret the times. Jesus is working. You hear about these testimonies. Pastor Ken shared a story right up here. We watched the video of a pastor here in Chicago whose son was murdered. And then the murderer came to faith in Christ and wanted to apologize to the dad. And the dad embraced this murderer of his son and forgave. You can interpret the times. Jesus is working at our marriage conference. I was sitting right over here and they had people stand up who've been married 25 years or more. Susan and I stood up and I looked around the room. Many couples standing up, making it 25 years of marriage. You think about all of the disagreements and arguments and struggles and the Difficult times and the conflicts, and yet they are still together. How? You can interpret the times. Jesus is working during a pandemic when so many people are not wanting to come out or want to come to a church building and gather. We've had 600 people visit our church in the last 10 months. They've actually showed up here in our building, and we've had 20 people confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. We've had 22, 23 baptisms right here in these 10 months. How do we know what is happening? You can interpret the times. Jesus is working all around you. There are examples of Jesus working, and so we just need to open up our eyes. But some people don't want to see it. Some people are so set in their ways. It was a coincidence. I know you asked me to pray about this for a month, and yeah, it did happen, but man, it's a coincidence. You know, it, it could have been anything, and they will deny it. That is a testimony of one of my friends. When the rain comes, you know what to do. You pull out an umbrella. When the heat starts to come, you know what to do. You go and change the temperature so that the air conditioner will come on. You may not think you see it, but you see it. If you ask the Lord for a sign, he will show it to you. God is working. Your faith should be strengthened by what you see. So what should you do with all these signs that are all around us? Jesus is building on something here. It's building. Maybe we need to respond. There's a time of division. It's a message. It's a divisive one. There's a time of discernment. All the things that you see happening Jesus is moving all around, showing evidence. But finally, let's consider this. Jesus is moving people towards a decision. The time is now a time of decision for freedom from judgment. A time of decision for freedom from judgment. 
And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? Look around you, right? He's saying, just think for a moment about all that you see and think about your own life. Just judge yourself for a moment and think about what is right. Verse 58, as you go, he's now going to tell a little parable, a story. As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer put you in prison. Using the example now of a personal relationship, Jesus will use that as a jumping board to explain what it's like to approach God the Father, the judge, at the end. Settle with your accuser now before you get to the judge. So two people, they're in a dispute, and you want to settle it as you're walking towards the magistrate, somebody who's a a ruler who's got some authority and power, settle it. Hey, let's just work it out. I know what I owe you. Let's, let's settle this out before we get there. And if you can't settle it, you get to the magistrate. The magistrate says, you know what? I'm not going to deal with this either. I'm going to take you to the judge. Now the judge says, forget this. You need to pay even more. So do everything you can. If you are guilty, if you've done wrong, settle with the accuser before you get to the judge because it could be terrible for you. We could think about this with um, our children. This is just a made-up story, but I'll use my own family. You know, once upon a time, just, you know, this didn't actually happen. Once upon a time, there was two children, Josiah and Nathan, and they were six and four, and they were playing in the backyard, and they were playing a game. Okay, this is true. They were playing a game where they throw stuffed animals at each other while they're covered with a blanket, and the other person needs to guess what animal was thrown at them. (laughs) Josiah was covered up, and Nathan threw a cage at Josiah's head and hit him on the head, and he opened up, and it was very difficult, and he was upset. Okay, that was the only part of the truth now. Now I'm making up the rest of the story. Josiah gets up, and he starts to be very upset about this because of what Nathan has done, and so then he says to Nathan, I'm going to go tell mom. Nathan's saying, please don't do it. Listen, I'm sorry. Take the, throw it back at me. I'll just, let's, just, let's just settle right now before we get to mom. No, I'm going to tell mom. He's blocking the door. Please don't do it. Josiah gets through him and opens up the sliding door. Mom! And he comes up to the kitchen, and there's mom. And he says, mom, you won't believe what Nathan did to me. Look at this mark on my head. He threw something at my head. And Nathan's saying, no, please don't do this. And mom says, I can't deal with you guys. I've been dealing with you all day long. Wait till your dad comes home. (laughs) She could have been the judge. I'm not saying that the dad has to be the judge, but in our story, the judge is going to come later. Now, the judge comes back from work, and he's been busy just dealing with all of you, right? And the dad comes home, and he's stressed, (laughs) and he walks in the house, and the first thing is your children, and you know it's over. And so then they're like, Dad, he did this, and we weren't playing a game, and on and on. It's like, fine, both of you. No TV, go to your room. It could be worse if you don't settle it. If you had just taken care of it while you had an opportunity to negotiate it, to talk it out, the punishment is getting more and more severe as you approach the judge. So we want to make sure that we settle the dispute. See, this is just an illustration to talk about what is going to happen to every person one day. He's using a parable This isn't exactly about us settling our accounts with one another. This is about us settling our account with God, of being right with him. He is driving people to a decision. Settle with your accuser now. But there are some practical applications for believers as well. And so for those of us who follow Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you should take this into account. Settle with people now. If you are upset at your brother, go and work it out with him. Leave your offering there. Go and work it out and then come back and worship God. Deal with these things. Jesus says, if you don't forgive one another, you won't be forgiven yourself. And so we should, as followers of Christ, settle with one another. We should try to be at peace with one another. But for those of you whose accounts are not settled with God, here's what Jesus has to say. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. You will never get out. See, logically, if you were in jail, you can't work to pay it off. And so you will be in jail forever. It's an eternal punishment Jesus is talking about here. It's better to settle now that you're out and able to plead your case 
as opposed to waiting until judgment because you can't make the decision then. Jesus is driving you to a decision before you get to the judge. The judge has sent his son to settle your accounts. All you have to do is say, I want Jesus to pay for my debt. If you are unsettled, if you have no peace, if you don't know what's going to happen after you die, Jesus wants to settle your accounts. You have sinned. You've done wrong. There's a debt that's rising. Jesus wants to pay for your debt. That's why someone as beautiful and as peaceful and as loving as Jesus ends up bloodied and dead, baptized in his death on a cross because he loves you. And your response is one of confession. Now, most of us won't find ourselves before a judge or even in a jail or before an officer. Most of you are law-abiding citizens, and so you may not find yourself in a situation like this. So let's use another example. Let's just talk about actual debt, money debt that we owe. Let's talk about credit card debt for a moment. When I was in college, I was at University of Maryland. I left my dormitory at Cumberland, and I started to walk towards Hornbeck Library. And in Hornbeck Library, in that courtyard, there was a table sitting there. And on this table, they had all of these applications for credit cards. And all the bank people, I don't know what bank it was, but they're in their red shirts, and they're there, and they're saying, hey, you want a University of Maryland towel or a keychain or some little trinket and like a moth to a flame? You know, I, I'm out of control. <laughs> And I walk over and I say, yeah, I need a red towel. <laughs> and how much income do you make? Zero with a little slash. It's not an O, it is a zero. Okay, great. Just wait, you'll see what your credit will be. And then I get a credit card. I have zero income. The only income I have is whatever my parents would give me. Zero income. And I get a credit card and I get into trouble. Nobody taught me. I'm the youngest, like I'm 11 years younger, so foolish. Youngest ch children sometimes can be very foolish. Not always, but sometimes very foolish. And so my older brother and sister never had this problem. My parents never had this problem. They never told me. I think when you get to the 11 years later, you're just like, they'll figure it out. <laughs> and they just assume we know. And I didn't know. And I was foolish. And so I built up this credit that I couldn't get out of for six years. I always paid the minimum. I always paid the minimum, so my credit score was good, but I had debt, and it took a long time for me to pay that off. It's a difficult thing. Now, some of you are like, I don't have any credit card debt, but some of you have home debt. Some of you could think about home debt. Back in 2007, 2008, the home mortgage crisis where they were giving loans to everybody and housing prices were skyrocketing and people got into homes that they really couldn't afford. And then some of you here in our church, I remember walking you through it, were over your heads. You were underwater, they say. The mortgage amount is worth more than your home value. You're underwater. And so you made deals with the banks. Some people here, they filed for bankruptcy. They said, there's no way out. I can't do this. Some of you uh, made the deal. You settled. You short-sailed. You did all that you could do to try to settle because you knew that it wasn't going anywhere. Pastor Eddie gave me permission to say this. He said he lost his house and his business during that mortgage crisis because his business was mortgages at the time. We weren't underwater, but we lost uh, quite a bit of value in our home. It was a very difficult time. But what would you have felt if somebody came to you and said, you know what, I, I see that debt that you have, that credit card debt that's mounting, it's hard for you to pay. I know you made some mistakes to get into that. I'm going to pay it all. I'm going to just, I'm just going to wipe it all off. I'm going to, it's going to be like you never had it. And you're going to have perfect credit. Just imagine if somebody would do that. Nobody would do that for us, but somebody would do it for us. That's what Jesus did for us. Your debt is rising. Some of you are underwater. You're drowning. You're dying. You're suffocating. You're choking, not about money, but about life. And Jesus says, I want to pay off all the debt. I want to wipe it clean. I want to make you new again. I want to make it as if you never did anything. You're going to have a perfect credit score. And this is what I want you to do. Just, just change. Don't, don't do that anymore. Be holy. Don't get into that cycle again. And, but if you get into that cycle again, listen, just ask for forgiveness. But don't just keep doing it because you're going to get the forgiveness because that doesn't treat me well. And you might not even really be a follower of mine. And so this is what the Bible teaches about us and debt. And we have paid we cannot pay the debt. 
It is too much. You're going to keep on paying all throughout eternity. So settle with your accuser now. He will give you a perfect credit score and he'll wipe away every debt. Some of you, your sin is just rising up. The things you're doing, the things you're saying, the the ways that you act, it just keeps rising up and you feel so challenged and maybe even condemned at times. But there is one, just one, and his name was Jesus. And Jesus, the speaker here who is giving us this message, he has a heart for each of you. And he says, I want to settle it. Settle it. So settle with your accuser. Settle with your accuser before you get to the judge because by then it will be too late. The time is now a time of decision for freedom from judgment. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And some people say, well, why did he even have to do this? Because God wanted us to be people who were free. And so we were able to live and make choices. And we made wrong choices. And the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person, even the preacher here today, sins. And because of that, all, none is righteous, but there is one righteous, and he is the debt canceler. He is the settler of accounts. His name is Jesus, and Jesus wants to settle up maybe with some of you today. Settle with your accuser now. If you wait till judgment, it will be too late. You can't make this decision once you die. You need to settle right now while you're alive. We're going to have an opportunity in just a moment to give some of you an opportunity. If there's anybody here, I don't know if there is or not. You know, most people that come to our church, they're already followers of Christ. But maybe there's some of you who have never confessed Jesus. You don't know where you're going. You haven't settled your accounts yet. We're going to have an opportunity to respond in a moment. We're going to sing in just a moment, but let's pray uh, first. Father, we thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it instructs us and challenges us. Father, I pray, Lord, in in just uh, the most uh, simple way I can pray, God, I pray that if there are any here today who are unsettled, well, that's a powerful word, unsettled. Maybe their stomach is churning a little bit right now. They don't know where they would be if they were to die because of their sins. Lord, if that unsettling is there in their heart, I pray, God, that you would do this work of settling things with them right now. Father, I pray that you would move in our church, our community, God. If there's any here, I pray that there would be some, Lord, that are struggling with this, that they would live a life without condemnation anymore. They would come to you and that you would settle it for them once and for all. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we respond, let's just sing this song here, just a verse and a chorus here. Just prepare your hearts. If this is you, just think about these words and let's stand.
I have a question. How many of you here have confessed Jesus as Lord? Just put your hands up. You already confessed Jesus as Lord. All right. So when you confess Jesus as Lord, now you put your hands down. When you confess Jesus as Lord, how many of you, it won't be everybody, how many of you it was just like a few of you at the time who did it? Like just a, just a couple of you who came forward or maybe it was like you with one other person. There's Some of us were like that. Okay, so... For those of you that are unsettled, if there are, I don't know. I just don't know. I have no idea. I'm not like, oh, hey, you know, we're going to preach this message because this person, your mom called and said, hey, my, my daughter's unsettled, and so preach this message. I have no idea. You know, we don't know. The Lord knows. But if you're at this place where you're unsettled, just know that everybody had a point where they made a profession of faith, and maybe today is your opportunity to say this, I've confessed Jesus I've confessed Jesus. And so if you've already confessed Jesus, Lord, just say that. I've confessed Jesus as Lord. Wow, that's awesome to hear. And if you've never been settled with Jesus, would, would you just put your hand up if you want to do that and join this crowd of people? Is there anybody here who would want to just lift up their voices and say that same phrase? Anybody? I should have had everybody seated so I can see. You don't need to sit. It's all right. I can see your hands. All right. Well, you can be seated for a moment. I have something else I want to share with you. After a profession of faith, the next uh, step in a believer's life is to uh, be baptized. It's believe and be baptized. Uh, baptism is the identification with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. In today's death, Jesus talks about his baptism. He was already baptized in the water. We saw the testimony here. Sadie was baptized in the water today for her profession of faith. And the good news is that we don't need to have a baptism of our death anymore. But what we do is we identify with Jesus in baptism. That's why we go under the water. It is his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, it's a picture. It's a picture of what Jesus has done. And so because we had the water filled already, we just, and we know there are some people in our church who follow Jesus and they have been baptized. We said, well, let's just have an opportunity for anybody that wants to be baptized to be baptized today. We have shirts and shorts and towels and leaders will pray with you. And so we have an opportunity right now uh, for some of you. And so if um, you've never been baptized after belief, I just want to challenge you with this. Here's a couple of things some of you may say. I was baptized as a child and that was my testimony. My parents baptized me when I was three years old. But they made a decision, and I'm so thankful they wanted to raise me in the faith, but the Bible says, believe and be baptized. Believe and be baptized. And so I walked, oh, I wasn't with Jesus from three years old until 21, and then at 21, I confessed Christ. And so all those years, I was without faith. I didn't believe, I didn't confess, I wasn't going to heaven. And yet I was baptized. And so I'm very thankful for parents who made decisions like that, but you should believe and be baptized. So if you've believed and you were baptized as a child in some other church, maybe you should come forward and be baptized after your belief. Some of you are students. Maybe some of you are students and you've never been baptized. You believe in Jesus. You've trusted the Lord. You grew up in a family just like Haiti over here. And um, you've never been baptized. Uh, my children, all three of my children were baptized in services like this. They just came forward and I got to baptize all three of them at some point. And so if you're a student here and you haven't been baptized yet, you could just turn to your parents and say, hey, I, I want to be baptized. And one of your parents can join you in the tank as well. And so maybe you're a student who has repented and turned. You may want to be baptized. You can tell your parents about that and you can come forward. Some of you say, I'm too old to be baptized. <laughs> I got gray hair, I, I, you know, I, well, Ruth Benson was baptized in her 80s. I baptized her right over here. I was a little bit more careful with her than I was with my children. <laughs> but she said, I'm in my 80s and I have been walking with Jesus, but I've never been baptized. And so we baptized her and she gave her testimony here. Jeff Key's in this service. Jeff loves Ruth like I love Ruth too. And what a great service that was to see a gray-haired person get baptized. And so you're never too old. If you've been walking with Jesus and you haven't been baptized yet, why are you waiting? Just do it. Maybe it's the, today's the day. 
And some of the young people are going to take courage from you coming forward here today. Some of you say, do I really need to be baptized? I mean, look, come on, pastor, your theology is off. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And yet, if the thief on the cross had made it through the sentencing time and he had seen Paul on a road and Paul had professed Jesus, he would have believed and he would have been baptized if he could have done it. But he was going to be killed. And so today he'd be in paradise. So your baptism doesn't save you. But save people, get baptized. And so if you want to be baptized, get baptized. Some of you are like, you know, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, my boyfriend, my girlfriend. I was like, they're not here today, and so I don't want to do this. Listen, you fill in your blank. My fill in the blank isn't here. We're going to video it. It's going to be even HD quality that you can send to them. As a matter of fact, you can post this yourself and your friends and family all over the world can see your testimony of coming to faith in Christ. So if you have never been baptized, we have an opportunity. We're going to sing a song and we're going to open up the front. And if that's you, come. I don't know. I don't know. But if the Lord is moving in your heart, you can come forward and be baptized. So let's sing. Let's stand once again. And we're going to sing. If that's you, you can come forward and uh, we'll have some baptisms here before we go.